Welcome uh, to the Deep Dive. This is week six, final week of Love Where You Live series, joined by Pastors Chris, Pastor uh, Ben. Um, how Brother, you ben. Brother Ben. Brother Ben. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> how you guys doing? Doing well. A little bit rested up with, uh, you know, Memorial Day having off and having some time to, to chill, so feel good. Yeah. Yeah, things are good, ready for summer, and excited. Uh-huh. So... How do you guys feel uh, this series as a whole has been? I, I think it's been great. I mean, I think it's had a huge impact on our church. I think people are excited about thinking outside of their own property line, their mm-hmm. borders, and into what God would have for them around around their, their neighborhood. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm probably biased, you know, because sure. obviously I, <laughs> I had some skin in the game, but I, I do think that... Hopefully people were uh, inspired and equipped like throughout the series to neighbor. I hope it can be in our DNA as a church mm-hmm. long term, that it's not yeah. just a flash in the pan of, oh, we did our neighboring thing, now we can go back to yeah. being isolated. Well, it's kind of the fear, right? Yeah. Even as we were preparing for this series, this would be just, oh, it's another series, yeah. it's something mm-hmm. that we can leave in the past. And and I do know, you know, our series uh, has a website, calvary.church slash neighbor um, or slash love where you live. Uh, that I think that you know a lot of the resources we've put together, these conversations we've had with Sh- with Shauna Pilgreen, with Chris mm-hmm. McKinney, yeah, um, these are things that that again, it's a hope that this is part of our DNA moving forward. That as we're creating events, as we're having conversations with small groups, like, hey, how do you neighbor well mm-hmm. for the sake of the gospel in the place that God has placed you? Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that hopefully will continue. Totally, I think I think too, it's perfect timing. I mean, coming kind of on the end of COVID here, and now it's a way for us to really kind of branch out, reach out, yeah. think outside of um, being and in, you know inside for a long time. So. Yeah. yeah. How has that been? I, this is going off script a little bit, but this past weekend, um, mm-hmm. well, two weekends ago at this point, was the last, you know, we pulled the masks away. Now, you guys mm-hmm. have been outside. Yeah. Uh, what difference, I, I don't know, like what effect do you feel like that has had on our congregation, on our community, yeah. and, and even this idea of like neighboring even within the walls of our church? Yeah. Yeah, I do think we're going to have to navigate the new normal of relearning some things Mm -hmm. we just took for granted, like before the pandemic of, okay, we're going to have people in our homes again, and we're going to be physically located with people again. And um, I think in a lot of ways, this is good because the pandemic was a physical crisis, is also a mental crisis. Uh And and I think sometimes that gets swept under the current of everything else that is happening. So there's a lot of people... Um, isolated and, you know, um, obviously, you know, men- mental health crises have, have gone mm-hmm. through the roof, mm-hmm. like over the last year and a mm-hmm. half. So I do think to pull out of that isolation and back to a physical space as, you know, things are increasingly safer, mm-hmm. I think will be key. I think we'll have to kind of relearn to, it's like riding a bike, but it's a little clunky at first. Yeah. 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 And then what about, what about you? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it's, I think it's good. I mean, it's good that we're moving forward. It's good that there's an end um, in sight with sure. this. I think at the same time, um, you know, we need to be respectful, mindful that mm-hmm. there are people on, you know, various different kind of stages with this and how they see safety. And so, uh, you know, we, we've kind of removed the, our, you know, our mask and some of our protocols, but at the same time, I uh, want to make sure people feel welcome, people feel included. Yeah. Um, all that yeah. so and yeah. just you know friendly reminders brushing your teeth is a good thing uh chewing gum <laughs> breath yeah. mints you know things that we haven't really had to think about for that's the last right year. <laughs> yeah <laughs> there are some scary mustaches <laughs> out there <laughs> there are surprisingly so yeah uh, yeah anyway well uh for today um kind of the the topic was, is sacred ground right so when mm-hmm. you guys yeah. hear that phrase what what comes to your mind i mean for me sacred ground i think uh, you know, the burning bush, right? And, mm-hmm. and, yeah. and Moses and Yahweh there in Exodus. Um, we've talked about that passage uh, before um, as well. But uh, yeah, what comes to y'all's mind? Yeah, I just keep thinking, I think it's been mentioned several times in um, the series, just through uh, various teachers, but that, you know, we sometimes think sacred ground is, is here at church, mm-hmm. uh, the physical building, the place where we gather and have service and we do uh, worship and teaching from the Bible, and so that's that's sacred. And mm-hmm. then uh, we go about our our lives and our and our week. But to think about um, you know mowing the grass, walking, um, taking a walk, and meeting a neighbor and talking to a neighbor that that in itself is 
um, a place where God can show up and mm. a place where God um, meets us and meets other people. And so I think there's a lot of purpose with that term, sacred ground. So kind of a, it's a continuation of like the t- trying to remove the sacred secular di- divide. Yeah, yeah, and I think too, it's it's understanding. You know, when we come to church, it's we're, we're serving. You know, we're serving, we're giving to God, we're receiving yeah. from Him, we're learning, and then we take what we've experienced, what we've learned, and we take that and go out um, to the people that God would have around us, mm-hmm. and um, and we share mm-hmm. that in in various ways. So. Yeah. Yeah, Chris, what about, you? what about you? Yeah, I mean, really just echoing what Ben said, it's it's good to always tear down that kind of false dichotomy of sacred and secular. And I do think, unfortunately, naturally, there is a sense of if I'm on a mission trip, if I'm at church on a Sunday or mm-hmm. in some kind of, you know, organized initiative or event, this is somehow, you know, more missional when the fact is, like, we've been given a place, an address in a city to live sent in, and this is this is sacred ground um, in our apartment complex, on our mm-hmm. cul-de-sac, in our neighborhood. So, um, yeah, cool. Yeah, cool. Uh, well, Ben, let's start. Let's start with you. This mm-hmm. weekend, um, you guys kind of took two different directions, two different passages to kind of talk about the same, the same thing. Yeah. Uh, in this week, um, you you landed in in the book of Mark, mm-hmm. uh, Mark chapter four, Mark chapter five. Can you just give us some context? Yeah. So when I thought about sacred ground, I, I the story of Jesus going to the Decapolis, I was really drawn to that because mm-hmm. I could see. Um, kind of his, you know, what they thought of sacred ground was where Jesus usually ministered or mis- mm-hmm. it was in uh, Capernaum, was in, um, you know, G- Galilee, was in that area. It was highly Jewish population. They had an Old Testament God framework. Um, they went to synagogue across the Sea of Galilee, across the street, you might even think, is the Romans. And in the city of Decapolis, um, hmm, they didn't. They didn't really have much framework. They didn't. Hmm. Um, they didn't go to synagogue. They. I mean, it was uh, very atheistic. And so, uh, for Jesus to go there and take his disciples there was uncommon. Hmm. And uh, so, um, I just thinking that you know he, Jesus crossed the street. Jesus was going to people who were very different from him, and uh, he was going there to serve. He was going there to help and. Um, you know, he, he meets a man who's demonized, he heals that man. And, um, the, the, I think the interesting part for, uh, for us and thinking about closing out this series was he, you know, the man begs to go with Jesus. Mm-hmm. Why, why wouldn't he? I mean, any of us, mm-hmm. you know, would love to go with, with Jesus after an, after a healing like that. But Jesus says, I want you to stay here, go back to your neighborhood. And, um, and then it's not until several chapters later um, that Jesus actually comes back to the Decapolis. And um, when he first came, it was nobody was there to greet him. It was a man running out from the cemetery who was there because he was demonized and nobody knew mm-hmm. what to do with him. When he comes back a second time, crowds of people are coming to him. And, um, and that man, you know, n- neighbored well. And mm-hmm. um, we saw uh, just the effects of um, what Jesus told him to do, just share your story. Just tell, tell people what God's done in your life. Hmm. That's good. Yeah, and I do think, you know, so the ancient world, um, you have cities that are around, right, the Sea of Galilee, and so the the, the sea really does turn into a highway. It does mm-hmm. turn into a, a place to go from one place to the other. Different mm-hmm. areas uh, just geographically have differences from, from one another. Uh, mm-hmm. The Decapolis, the, the like, what what is that? Yeah, so the Decapolis is a Roman um Area de, um, deca, deca is means ten, and polis means city. So we get Indianapolis, Minneapolis of from you that. Go to Indianapolis first. Uh, of course, I would. <laughs> I'm from Indiana, Loser. so <laughs> so um, so it's just it's ten cities, and it was set up. It was actually a um, an area that was set up for um, for veterans hmm. um, who served in the war, and obviously they had a, a huge army. The Romans did, and so. Um, it, it was kind of an advanced place, um, uh, you know, as far as just um, medical and um, schools and education. And mm. so it was a pretty advanced culture. Um, very different culture. From, from Capernaum and from the other areas. Very, very Valley. different. I mean, Capernaum was like, you know, small town feel. This yeah. was kind of more bigger mm. city. I, you know, 10 cities, it's kind of like this area out here. It's you have O'Fallon, you have St. Charles, 
you have um, Darting Prairie, you have Lake St. Louis, you have all these kind of cities that are hmm. connected to each other. That was the, I, I think that was, that's kind of uh, the, yeah, the yeah. best way to think about it. Uh, Jesus' disciples. So as, as he crosses, you know, what might be, you know, these are Jewish men. Mm-hmm. What might be going through their mind? Yeah, oh, it was a bo- Jesus drops a bomb when he says, hey, w- let's go to the other side. And when he yeah. says, let's go to the other side, he's not just talking about some random place. He meant the Decapolis, and they knew that's what he meant. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the bomb is dropped, and then when they get there, you know, there's a man that comes running out to them screaming and yelling for Jesus, and they're probably thinking, this wasn't in the manual. You know, what do we do here mm-hmm. with this? We have no training for this at all, and um, and I think, you know, part of sacred ground is um, is God working through us, and mm-hmm. so sometimes we don't know what to do with our neighbors. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes they're like us; they live in a broken world, so they have um, complications and they have difficult situations, and sometimes that's, that's what can keep us from our neighbors is we just don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. And I think the disciples were probably thinking. We don't know what to do with this, mm-hmm. um, but Jesus doesn't think that way, and Jesus knew what to do. And so I think for us, it's um, you know, it's it's taking those steps of serving, holding truth out, having conversations, and seeing what God would do with it. Yeah, so. that's good. Chris, um, you kind of focused more on First Corinthians. There's yeah. a situation between um, different leaders, different people that, yeah. that um, you know, different followers of Christ or kind of almost pledging allegiance to. Uh, can you just give us some context on that? Yeah, there's a little bit of a controversy in the mm-hmm. early church. So people are kind of aligning with, um, you know, these people who have, I guess, what you would call a small level of celebrity. Nothing compared to what we would sure. think of celebrity sure. today. But, you know, people are aligning with Apollos or people are aligning with Paul and they're kind of picking sides and there's division in the church. And mm-hmm. um, I mean, we see that today, right? Like, oh, sure. I'm with this denomination. Sure. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm with this pastor, whatever. So to some degree, this is happening in the early church. And Paul kind of wants to set the record straight in First Corinthians. Mm-hmm. He wants to say, hey, listen, someone's got to plant the seed. Someone's got to till the soil. Someone's mm-hmm. got to water it. And then God's going to give the growth. And then someone, by the grace of God, is actually going to be able to harvest. Mm. So if we think about this as someone showing hospitality, they're tilling the soil, Mm -hmm. they're letting know like, hey, this is the love of Christ through my life. Someone initially shares the gospel, right? They're planting the seed. And then maybe that person's in community or another person shares the gospel and that person starts to realize, oh, hey, this is important. So they're watering. God gives the growth, and then, you know, there's the moment where maybe someone gets to baptize that person or gets Mm -hmm. to welcome them into membership in the church. And Mm -hmm. so, like, there's all these stages of tilling and planting and watering. And so Paul is saying, don't get caught up in the name of who you're associating with, Apollos or Paul. Like, we're all having a step and a mission in this process. Oh, and by the way, God's going to give the growth. So to align with anyone to, to boast or to take yeah, credit yeah, for, yeah. like, it's just folly. It's yeah. foolish because only God's ever going to get the growth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what does that have to do with this idea of sacred ground? Yeah. Well, it has a lot to do because if we believe mm-hmm. that we have been placed for a purpose where we live, in the time mm-hmm. we live, in the culture we live, mm-hmm. in the language we live, with the people we live by, then... We have to believe that we are somewhere in that process. Mm. We're either tilling, we're watering, we're planting, Mm. or maybe we're even harvesting. Mm -hmm. And so we're somewhere in that continuum. And here's the thing. We don't always know where we're at. Your neighbor may shut you down. It may seem like a closed door. Mm -hmm. So till the soil and pray. Maybe that doesn't become a conversation till another neighbor Mm. has a conversation with them. And then maybe the seed's planted. So we're always going to be playing different parts in the continuum, but we have a part to play. Mm -hmm. And in the soil we till and water and plant, there's going to be thorns, and there's going to be thistles, and there's going to be rocks, and it's not always going to be easy. stupid rabbits that are eating your miracles. (laughs) There you go. So, you know. It's not always going to be easy, but we have a role to play in that wherever Mm -hmm. we're placed. And I think once we realize that and we take on those roles Mm -hmm. of praying for a door to be opened Uh 
or having an initial conversation with a door that's cracked or to full on, you know, be leading, helping lead someone to Christ through the door that's wide open, Mm -hmm. wherever we're at in that, um, we have a calling, we have a mission, we have purpose Mm -hmm. as the Mm -hmm. people Mm -hmm. of God in that. I, I think that's what I've really liked about this series is just we're, we're naming, we're calling, we're putting purpose to what probably hopefully a lot of us mm-hmm. are already doing. Mm-hmm. And I think that yeah. that really, um, it kind of sheds light into our, you know, our, our mission as, as, as Christians and as a yes. church that, you know, we kind of scatter around and we do the best that we can with what we have and God can, God can use that. And so that's what I've, mm-hmm. I've appreciated about about yeah. the, the series the most. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. so there's something in this passage. Um, this Apollos guy, I've, I've, mm-hmm. I'm always fascinated because we don't really know a whole lot yeah. about him. Um, Paul, I think yeah. he doesn't really want us to know a whole lot yeah. about him. Uh, do we know anything? Like, what do we know about this dude? So not a ton. Yeah. Um, we know that he's got some kind of following. He mm-hmm. is a part of the early church. There are minority reports. There are scholars out there will, that will actually make some kind of argument that he's the author of Hebrews. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And so we see this kind of in flashes at times of maybe this is, you know, because we don't know we don't, who wrote Hebrews. We don't know who wrote Maybe Hebrews. Barnabas, maybe Apollos. We don't know. Hey, some, like, yeah. yeah, some people <laughs> argue Apollos. Yeah. So um, we don't know all the details like Paul. We don't mm-hmm. have this massive conversion mm-hmm. story in the missionary journeys, but... Um, you know, we do know he's someone of influence, mm-hmm. and I love how Paul is setting the example of, hey, even though, you know, we may be in different locales, or maybe we have different backgrounds or yeah. differing opinions, like, that's a brother, and, um, you know, he's mm-hmm. he, maybe he's planting, and I'm watering, or he's tilling, mm-hmm. and I'm planting, and so, like, all of this is coming together yeah. for the good mm-hmm. of the church. Yeah. Yeah. And I do love, I mean, I, I think this is kind of the point we're making here is we don't know a whole lot about Apollos. And right. He had, he had influence in the early church. He had influence yeah. with uh, Christians at the earliest stages of our uh, heritage, of our tradition, of our yeah. story. And yet that's okay because it's God's story. It's not my yeah. story. It's not your story. It's not you know, your mm-hmm. story then. And I think uh, at times, this is a temptation for me, right? Like, oh, I need to be doing big stuff for mm-hmm. the kingdom. I need to be yeah. writing books. I need to have a mm-hmm. speaking tour. I need to have a whatever. And like the greatest thing I think that maybe any of us are probably ever going to do is be faithful to the people that we live next to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Totally. So I think if we're neighboring well in the mundane, in the ordinary, in the, shall we even say, repetitive and boring, mm-hmm. if we're doing that really well... We may never get recognition until we get to worship with that person ten thousand years mm-hmm. from now. Mm-hmm. That's good, and that's Not okay. That's okay. I, I think too. I mean, just the act of being faithful to understand. Uh, here's what I'm doing. Yeah. There's purpose to this, and I'm going to. Um, I'm going to give myself. I'm mm-hmm. going to serve. I'm going to yeah. um, have spiritual conversations. I'm going to pray. I I think there is a. Hey, I'm following God in this. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm obeying. Yeah. I'm doing what, what you know, God has put me on mission to do. And there's, um, there's a sense of, you know, of God saying, "Well done, good job." And yeah. there may not be the fruit that we want, but yeah. at least that we're putting. Yeah. You know, we're following. Or you may through. never see it. Right. Someone, you may move out of the neighborhood. Someone else may move in. Right. And be the harvester. You don't know. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Well, as we kind of move from this series, what are some of your hopes moving forward mm-hmm. for us as a church, for people in our congregation, um, this love where you live? We already kind of talked. We hope this is something that continues to be part of the DNA for our, our church. Mm-hmm. But I guess what are some maybe small next steps you hope to see people take over the next few weeks, the next couple of months, the mm-hmm. next six months or a year? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think one thing is um, I want to see us in mindset and heartbeat pivot from, hey, the days of let's all gather in an auditorium for the out-of-town speaker or Mm. the well-spoken pastor, like those days just culturally, if they're not completely gone already, like they will be. Mm. And so it's pivoting to realize as much as we are the gathered people of God, covenant people of God, partaking of the sacraments and worshiping our God, we are as equally the scattered people of God 
that we are, right, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Mm-hmm. So the workers are going to be scattered throughout communities and cities and countries all over the world. And in that, the gospel will go forth. Mm-hmm. So there probably was a short season where the big gathering of let's all come for the yeah. guest speaker, maybe that did have some effectiveness for a short season. Yeah. But that is the exception and the oddity when you look at the history of the church. Yeah. What we see is people gathered in a powerful way to be healed and nourished, to then be scattered yeah. and to bring the good news to the people who are in their neighborhood who are far from Christ. And you don't really get to choose the people you live next to sure. mm-hmm. most of the time, right? Mm-hmm. So odds are these people are going to have differing worldviews, opinions, backgrounds, histories, experiences with the church. And they're probably going to be more unchurched than your friend group mm-hmm. because your friend group's been curated a little bit because you've you've had similarities. Mm-hmm. But there's a powerful mission field at your address. Mm-hmm. How do we make that pivot? Because that's a hard mm-hmm. that's a hard sell. You know, we, we do the things that we do mm-hmm. because we like yeah. the yeah. things that we do. I, I think it's on our end. I mean, I think it's on our end as a church to really yeah. support, encourage, resource um, our, you know, our, 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 our church and our members and... Yeah. Um, you know, it's easy for us as a church to say we had this many people come to a Sunday morning service. We had we baptized this many people. Measuring success Those, is really easy it's, when everybody comes to you. Totally, yeah. it, it it is, and and there's nothing wrong with that. It just that's that's a way for us to gauge where where we're going and where we're at. But I do think how can we though recognize and how can we support mm-hmm. and how can we um, help us as a church as we go out in these secret ways. Um, in the ways that, you know, there's not a video camera, there's no, there's no way to measure it, um, but it is walking across the street and having that conversation. Mm-hmm. And how do, how do we help and equip people to do that? And I do think, too, I agree. I mean, you, you cannot choose your neighbors. That's the thing. You can choose where you go to church. You can choose yeah. the activities. You can choose your friends, but you cannot choose your you neighbors. You can choose so many things. You can choose so many things. And, <laughs> and it, I mean, it is that, that weird thing. I mean, we just recently got new neighbors across the street from us. Mm-hmm. And I, it's, that, it, it's that weird situation of... Okay, I'm happy for my neighbors that are that are leaving their next story. But who's coming in? Are they gonna <laughs> Are they gonna paint the house hot pink? Or what's gonna yeah. happen here? Uh, probably would say that. Yeah, yeah. Ben's hopefully, not hopefully, let that happen. <laughs> hopefully, but you never know. But it is kind of like family, where yeah. these are your people, and yeah, are they different? They have different worldviews. They have different ways they raise their kids. Um, and and that's okay. Jesus never saw people as enemies or opponents. He he. He saw mm-hmm. their spiritual condition, yes. and he loved them. And so I think that's how can we help people to see that's a win. Those are wins for the, for them and for us as a church. Yeah. 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 I think for me, some of the things that I'd, I'd love to see is um, families just spending a little bit more time in their front yard than in their backyard. Yeah. I mean, Amen. I, I love our backyard. Like, I am I kind of shared a little bit. I've planted flowers the rabbits yeah. we're in a, you know we're in a fierce battle right mm-hmm. now yeah um but like i love curating that space for our family to be uh, together mm-hmm. yeah but when you're in the front yard man there's conversations that that they don't happen when you're yeah. in the backyard there are people that you wave to there are people that you you know they're out walking their dog that you just connect with um yeah so there's something that happens in the front yard. so I, I would love to see that is people yeah. just yeah. hey we're gonna have dinner tonight let's Maybe we have it on the front porch instead of yeah. the back patio. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's it's those little intentional things, right? Like Haley and I, uh, we have a two car garage. We don't park in our garage because we know if we go in there, we're not going to see anyone. Mm-hmm. So we park in the driveway, and uh, then even if we're not in the mood or we're in a rush, it allows those moments to see our neighbors when they're out, yeah. pl- like playing in their yard or getting their mail, getting their trash, or just sitting on the front porch or whatever. Mm-hmm. So it's just those small, intentional decisions that over the years will accumulate into blessing for our neighborhoods. That's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, so our next series, just want to preview that a little bit. We started this coming weekend. Uh, it's called Through the Lens. We're going to be looking at... Um, movies and and other just cultural moments things that yeah. give us a little better awareness of the larger story that we find all of ourselves in so this this larger narrative that god is writing in our lives uh, about the world that we live in uh, we believe that movies uh are both a mirror right to understand ourselves and our own story but they're mm-hmm. also a, a lens by which we can understand 
uh, the world around us better. And so really excited about that series. Uh, ben, Chris, anything just on your mind, on your heart as we kind of kind of shift gears into that? It's a four-week series. Yeah. I think one of the most beautiful gifts we can receive and use as Christians is to be able to look um, at the art and the literature and the thoughts that our culture is producing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. whether by Christians or not, mm-hmm. and being able to see the bits of beauty and truth of the redemptive story in those. Because mm-hmm. yeah. I'm going to butcher this, but kind of going back to C.S. Lewis, there is one story, mm-hmm. there's one meta overarching story of God, and all other stories are grasping to wrestle with yeah. that one story. Yeah. And so in those stories, we're going to see beauty and depravity and everything in between. And it's going to tell us something, um, whether the people who made it were Christian or not, they, they may not even be knowing that they're touching on something that is the Imago Dei, that's image mm-hmm. bearing of yeah. God. Mm-hmm. And so can we see these things and celebrate and also critique and, yeah. and in, enter into these spaces. That's great. Yeah, yeah. We, we were teaching a class a couple, uh, couple months ago, and uh, we were talking about uh, Harry Potter and the Dark Knight. Yeah. And, I, and I, asked, I asked the people, I said, hey, are these true stories? And they're all like kind of, you know, deer in headlights. Yeah. Like, well, no, they're not facts. I said, but are they, are they true stories? Uh-huh. Do yeah. They, do uh-huh. they communicate something that is true about the world, about yes. reality, about our experience? Um, so, no, that, that's great. Yeah, I, I just think it's a creative um, series, is a creative way to mm-hmm. look at um, the story of God. And there are these elements that we see in the Bible and how to, how can we connect that to our culture mm-hmm. and what people are mm-hmm. creating and to show the similarities uh, with uh, and teach who God is. So I think it's great. Have you guys seen any good movies well, recently? The theater's been closed, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I watched, uh, oh, what was it called? Um I forget. It was it was up for an oh. Oscar. Um, it was a family. They were down in Arkansas. Uh, they had a, a farm that they were building. Uh, it was all subtitles. Wow. All subtitles. Yeah, it was all subtitles. In Missouri, it was all good. It was good. We uh, just saw Cruella. Have you okay, seen that? it's out already. Uh, Disney yeah, Plus. Disney Plus. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I was. I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm pre- I was impressed with it. I have to say, I I don't usually like those movies, but I really yeah. liked it. Did either of you watch Nomadland? Yes. Yeah, I, I really I, like I that. I haven't watched it yet. But I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, you can right. find uh, this deep deep dive and the rest of our deep dives on our website, calvary.church slash neighbor, uh, for our Love Where You Live series, as well as on our YouTube channel. Uh, just search Calvary Church uh, Mid Rivers or Calvary Online. Those will get you there. And uh, we will join you again next week. Can't wait to connect with you and jump into this new series through the lens. See you guys. <laughs>